Although sharks are experts at picking out good and profitable companies, sometimes they've regretted making offers to certain ones. In this video, we'll be taking a look at the top three Shark Tank products that the sharks regretted taking. Are these companies still in business or are they shut down for good? Stick around to find out. Hi, I'm Neil Desai and I'm the owner of KDAF. I'm seeking $50,000 for a 5% equity stake in my company. Neil Deze appeared on the second episode of the fourth season of Shark Tank with a privacy app called Kate App. He was looking for $50,000 for a 5% equity stake in the company. Kate App, a short way of saying call and text eraser, is a mobile application designed to hide notifications for calls and texts from specific contacts. Although it was initially targeted towards people involved in or suspected of infidelity, it also has broader privacy applications. Now it works by allowing users to create a list of contacts whose calls and texts won't trigger notifications on their screen. Kate App handles blacklisted contacts similarly to how spam numbers are blocked on Android. In June 2011, Phil Imler, a West Palm Beach police officer, developed the Kate App. He received inspiration after seeing a friend's difficult divorce involving incriminating texts. Motivated by the desire to assist victims of domestic violence, Imler, a former cop, recognized the app's potential during numerous domestic violence incidents linked to phone scrutiny. Neil Desay later bought it for $17,500. Now, whether or not we like it, we all know someone who's been cheated on, been accused of cheating, or who's actually cheated. Have you been there, Kevin? Whoa! <laughs> Tell me more! Neil told the Sharks they'd had to know somebody who had been cheated on, cheated themselves, or had been accused of cheating. He then showed him a video of a couple lying in bed. The gentleman receives a text and the woman quickly wants to know who it is and snatches the phone. She gets it and reads that message and accuses him of cheating on her. He denies he has no idea and she slaps him. Our video ends. Now Kevin's curious and wants to know more. Neil explained that the app prevents fights like this from happening by keeping those conversations more discreet. A large mock-up of a smartphone shows what the app looks like with functions like stealth mode and the ability to quick clean. Neil then pulled out the big guns. Statistics. According to him, 80% of marriages contain at least one unfaithful partner. Robert urged him to stop talking, but Neil claimed it was real. He went on to say his catchphrase, if love is blind, we keep it that way. Robert tried to explain to the crowd that it was a cheating app. Neil attempted to claim that it was a privacy app. Robert wasn't having any of it. He wanted to call a spade a spade and tell it as it was. Neil ultimately consented and stated that he was fine with it. Mark instructed him to go with it. Damon asked why he decided to develop this product, as he didn't look like the cheating type. Neil then mentioned that he wasn't the original developer for the app. Damon asked about Neil's investment in the app, and he revealed it was around 40000 Kevin was unsure about the morality of cheating and asked him about the sales. Neil revealed having approximately 10,000 customers. He said there was 4,000 free users and 5,500 paid ones. Robert asked about payments from actual cheaters, and Neil clarified that the app cost $4.99 on Apple and Android and $9.99 on BlackBerry. Damon asked why Neil was offering such a low percentage of the business, asking if he was genuinely seeking a deal. Neil explained that he knew equity was negotiable, and starting with a low amount was a strategy to see if any sharks would be interested with the option to go higher later. Robert then asked about his concerns regarding the morality of the product. Surprising Kevin, Kevin interrupted Neil's response, asserting that there were no moral issues. Kevin asked if he would prioritize making money over principles. Mark, understanding the focus on profit, remarked, this is not a morality tank. Mark stated that he liked his passion and hustle, but didn't like the app. He went out. I don't <laughs> cheat. I believe in what you believe in, okay? I know the only thing that matters in life is what? Money. Money. Yes. Of course. You and me. <laughs> we are in sync. I'm going to give you $50,000 right now for 50%. Let's go. Kevin challenged the app's valuation, offering $50,000 for 50% equity. Neil wanted to hear other offers before making a decision. Robert, with a different philosophy, didn't want to be in a business where he wouldn't feel comfortable bringing his kids to work and opted out. Damon, not his field, wanted to partner with Kevin. Kevin expressed interest, and Barbara, loving the app's idea, saw broader potential beyond cheating, suggesting rebranding as a privacy app. She offered $50,000 for 30% with a condition of rebranding. Kevin faced the decision, expressing that Barbara lacked experience in the software industry. I'll offer you guys 15%. Whoa, whoa, hang on, whoa, Neil. Neil. Yes, Neil. you take it, Neil. You're countering to all three of them. Yes. 
15% for 50,000. Correct. Neil countered all of them at 15%. Kevin told them to stop screwing around. He offered him 35% of the business for both Damon and him. Damon stated that this was the final negotiation for this agreement. Take it or he'll walk away. After they argued for a while, Barbara gave 25%. Neil came over to Kevin and Damon and asked if they would do $75,000 for 35%. They offered $60,000, and Neil countered that with $70,000 instead. They took it and shook hands. So how's the Kate app doing now? Even though Neil accepted their offer, the deal with Kevin and Damon was never finalized. However, Neil's appearance on the show did give the app some exposure, which helped boost their popularity. Shortly after the episode aired, more than 10,000 people, most of whom were women, downloaded the app. Not only that, but Neil was also able to convince law enforcement and government markets to use the Kate app. Unfortunately, it didn't last long. Within a few months, the app was removed from the Google Play Store. They never ended up releasing on iOS, which they'd previously said was in the works. It was only on Android up until their shutdown. While it was never mentioned why they had shut down, it looked like it ran into some financial difficulties, which is understandable given that the Shark Tank transaction didn't go through and the reason they were on the show in the first place was to seek funding. As of 2023, the company is still inactive. Their website has been inactive for several years, and they have abandoned their social media. So it looks like the Sharks may hold a regret for the Kate app. But what about this next company? Hello, Sharks. My name is Cole Egger. And my name is James McDonald, and our product is Sweet Balls. Sweet Balls made its Shark Tank bid in the premiere episode of Season 1. Cole Egger and James McDonald wanted $250,000 investment for 10% equity in Sweet Balls. Now, Sweet Balls are basically these cake balls that don't come with a stick. At the time, they also came in packs of four and were available in three flavors red velvet, chocolate, and cookies and cream. James and Cole founded Sweet Balls, with James being the seasoned entrepreneur with a background in finance. Now, despite James's financial success, he transitioned from a successful banking career to pursue a creative and personal passion for baking, leading him to envision a business opportunity. Meanwhile, Cole, who had a lifelong love for baking, transformed his cake decorating skills into a career after a successful stint in creative marketing. He decided to leverage his expertise in promoting innovative products. The pair came up with the concept of sweet balls when they recognized a gap in the market for convenient, portable, and delectable dessert options. They aim to craft a universally enjoyable product accessible anytime, anywhere. By combining McDonald's business acumen and Egger's baking skills, they established Sweet Balls. They took that traditional cake recipe, molded it into bite-sized balls, and added innovative and indulgent toppings. In 2013, they began manufacturing cake balls to sell in packs of four. With the flavors already explained, they started to establish a loyal customer base. Alongside selling on their own, you could find some Sweet Balls at 7-Eleven. Despite their success, Sweet Balls wanted to continue expanding the business, so they came on the tank. The best part about our cake balls, Sharks, they sell for a fraction of the cost of most local bakery cake balls. But before we go any further, we'd like to pass out a few samples for you to try. I hate you already. <laughs> now they passed out some samples to the Sharks, explaining that they'd hoped to speed up production to distribute the products. Cole told the Sharks that their product had done 700,000 in sales in the three months leading up to their pitch. The Sharks were impressed, but they were also concerned about the ability of James and Cole to be able to handle rapid expansion. The co-founders addressed these concerns by explaining their background rounds, passion for the product, and strategic plans for the company. With the Sharks just loving the taste of these sweet balls, things started to shift when the entrepreneurs explained more about their business. A significant 95% of that sale relied on 7-Eleven, leaving the Sharks concerned about what would happen to sweet balls if 7-Eleven were to drop them. Cole and James would tell the Sharks that they had gotten in with large distributors and would be able to expand into additional stores soon. They wanted to cut down on their 21-day turnaround rate and hoped an investment would allow them to increase inventory. However, the Sharks pushed back a hefty ask, explaining that no one would go in for only 10% equity. Okay, James, th things are going great for you. Why are you here? Because for us, it's about growth. Right now, one of the things we have is a 21-day turnaround. The 250000 would be used to offset some of our inventory needs so that we could get away from that 21-day lead time. So you're asking for 250000 for 25%. 
Barbara Cochran came out with the first offer. She would give him $250,000, but she wanted 40%. However, James and Cole were hopeful for a second offer. Kevin O'Leary was interested and offered the money as well. He said he would only take 30%, but also wanted an equal cash distribution. Lori Griner made an offer for 36% of the company and the same equal cash distribution, emphasizing her ability to get him into more retail spaces, as well as sales through QVC. Robert Herjavec also wanted in. He would give him 250 for a quarter of the company with no other royalties. Mark Cuban wasn't comfortable making an offer on his own, so he teamed up with Cochran. They settled on 250000 for 25%. So you got an offer from Barbara and Mark for 250000 for 25%. So would you agree with me there's value in having more than one shark in the deal? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, what if you had three sharks with the same offer. However, Herjavec wasn't ready to back down just yet. He said he'd work with Griner and O'Leary to offer the same money for 25%. O'Leary wanted his own 10%, so the deal was up to 30%. Finally, Mark and Barbara saw the long-term prospects and offered $250,000 for 25%, which was a counteroffer to the initial contract provided by the entrepreneurs. The two would decide to go with Mark and Barbara's deal. So, where is Sweet Balls today? Even though the two made a deal with Mark and Barbara, the Sharks apparently decided to not proceed with the deal. Sure, Sweet Balls didn't flop after being on the show, but the business struggled for several years afterward. Just 10 days after the tank appearance, James had sued Cole and their business partners for attempting to start a competing business. James would sue Cole, claiming he shut down the Sweet Balls website to create another brand called Cake Balls and eventually buy out Sweet Balls. Apart from that, the Sweet Balls website was overwhelmed with orders, to the point of being shut down while Cole and James tried to meet up. Unfortunately, after that website started accepting orders again, new problems arose. Cole was allegedly making decisions without James's input, even redirecting Sweetball's traffic to a secondary site. McDonald's sued Egger with a restraining order and took over as the sole owner of Sweetball's. If the lawsuit wasn't messy enough already, it came at its worst possible time when Sweetball's could have capitalized on its Shark Tank fame. Today, we can find some sweet balls on its website, shipping treats within the continental U.S., with potential international shipping in the future. Customers can buy a variety of balls featuring flavors from birthday cake, chocolate, salted caramel, red velvet, and cookies and cream, including a lemon option for summertime. Priced at $50 with free shipping, the variety packs contain 30 cake bites. As of 2023, the Sweet Balls website is still up and running, though it notes that online orders are closed during the summer months. Despite the active website, the business has been silent on social media since December 2020, leaving customers wondering whether or not Sweetballs was still in business, with Facebook comments asking where the website was and if they could still buy cake balls. Although the LinkedIn page indicates James McDonald's continued involvement, the business's value could exceed $5 million. Regardless, the Sweetballs website promotes the availability of the original cake pops and themed Sports Ball Z, featuring chocolates, cookies and cream, red red velvet, birthday cake, salted caramel, and those lemon flavors for delivery and food service. Hi, my name is Mark Bergenger. My invention is a construction toy called Cubits. And lastly, we have Mark on the 14th episode of Season 1 looking for $90,000 for 51% stake in Cubits. Now, Cubits are construction blocks that enable kids to build a variety of natural objects like snowflakes, trees, and spheres. Objects that were hard or impossible to build with common toy construction blocks. The blocks offered a kid the ability to construct anything and everything from boats, spacecraft, skyscrapers, to ships and spheres. They were easy to maneuver, clean, and locate. It was also very durable, meaning kids could use them for a longer time. Now, the pieces could float on water as well, making them a perfect choice for some games in the water. Cubits was founded by Mark Bergenger, a former USAF member pursuing an architecture degree. He enjoyed playing with building toys as a child, and this inspired him to pursue architecture. Mark started building Cubits in his garage. Amid a rough economy, he faced financial struggles accumulating debts of over $60,000. 
This affected his family, and with a garage full of cubits, he would end up on the shark tank looking for investments on his invention. During his pitch, Mark introduced himself and highlighted the uniqueness of cubits compared to other building toys in the market. He explained that these toys were both flexible and small, allowing users to shape them as they desired. Mark would explain the ease of use, mentioning the connections that simplified the assembly process. To support his claims, he demonstrated building a structure with cubits in just a few seconds. There's a part of me that's a little suspicious. You seem like a credible guy. It's very rare that somebody comes out here and voluntarily says, I'll give up 51% control of my company. Why? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, I'm smart. Number two, I want to put together the best board of directors anyone could ever imagine. Robert, however, was a bit suspicious about voluntarily giving up 51% of the company and wanted to know why Mark would do that. Mark explained that he was smart and aimed to set up the best board of directors by giving up the majority of shares. Damon asked about Qubit's patent, and Mark confirmed that they had one, emphasizing the uniqueness of Qubit's compared to other toys. Martin, how long have you been working with qubits. How long has this been on the market? Been on the market since November 07. What are the sales? I've managed to sell about $8,000 worth of the toy. Kevin asked about the qubits' time in the market, and Mark said they had been around since 2007, selling about $8,000 worth of toys. However, the sharks were unimpressed. Kevin mentioned the need for a partnership with big toy companies for qubits to have a future, so he was out. Robert said qubits couldn't compete with Lego, so he was out as well. Kevin Harrington and Barbara Cochran also agreed with the other sharks. They were out as well. I like the fact that you came in here offering 51% for $90,000, so here's what I'm going to do. I'll be the partner with you. With Kevin out, it looks like Damon John's the only shark left. He would express his concerns about various issues, acknowledging that he was new in the toy industry. Despite his worries, he loved Mark's approach of offering 51% of his company's ownership and appreciated Mark's Qubit idea and branding. So Damon was offered 90,000 for a 51% stake in Qubits. However, to seal the deal, Mark needed to reach out to one of the top four toy makers and secure a contract. After some thinking, Mark accepted Damon's offer. However, Mark wasn't able to secure a deal with one of those companies. Therefore, the deal with Damon never actually came to fruition. Despite the deal collapsing, John kept in contact with Mark. He would help him secure a deal with Discovery Toys, one of the leading toy distributors via home parties. They provided Qubits a way to get their toys to the market. The brand then witnessed a boost in sales. Qubits is still in business years after Shark Tank. It relocated to a new manufacturing firm in Henderson, North Carolina. Qubits generates about $1 million in sales per year and has a new modernized website.